थैंक यू एंड ओवर टू उमा शंकर डॉक्टर उमा शंकर पांडे माय को कन्वेनर फॉर दिस प्रोग्राम टू बिगिन द फोर्थ डे ऑफ ए आई इंडिया वेबिनार सीरीज डॉक्टर उमा शंकर पांडे प्लीज गुड आफ्टरनून फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू अनदर वंडरफुल वेबिनार सेशन टुडे we are back with another global stalwart we started off from uh, moscow with dr anna gladkova on monday then we went to us west coast with professor janet vasco in oregon then we went to leicester yesterday with professor graham murdock and today we are in denmark with uh, professor thomas tufte one of the uh, biggest names in communication for social uh, change research and somebody who's had worked on seven uh, research projects international research projects from 1992 to 2017 right from world bank to unicef to unesco to usaid and so many other organizations so uh, just offline we were talking about you know how his work has influenced a lot of indian universities as well uh, when we spoke about this uh, conference professor tufte was on a uh, holiday and i used to get you know those uh, uh, i'm on holiday messages but uh, still you know within such a short span of time you know the 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 support he has shown you know he was present at yesterday's session and you know uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know topic he's chosen for the day every way you know we can we cannot thank them enough for all the support and without their you know uh, uh, full fledged support this wouldn't have been possible so we are so happy to have you know uh, uh, you know global stalwart like uh, uh, professor thomas tufte he's the uh, Uh, director institute for media and creative studies lower university london and uh, uh, he's been uh, uh, you know looking at uh, intersections between interrelations between media text flows genres communicative practices and processes of citizen engagement and social change at the same time we have the senior most professor in a indian university right now chairing the uh, session uh, i'm personally indebted to him for for a lot of things he has been you know mentored us supported us and guided us in in every way possible so it is only but natural that somebody who's representing tezpur university the you know one of our foremost central universities the university where we have a formal communication for development ma program probably the only university in the country so it's only but natural that you know uh, professor sunil kanto behra would be chairing this session so without coming between the audience and uh, another special word of thanks to a friend of mine from egypt dr uh, fatma al said she is uh, joining us from cairo for this session so we've had a lot of international friends but i must specially thank she is a very uh, uh, old member of imcr and uh, very happy to uh, receive her you know uh, in the audience today so without coming between the audience and and and, and the stalwarts i hand over to uh, the president uh, the the session chair for the day professor sunil kanto behra over before, to you sir before dr Thank behra you. starts before dr yeah. behra starts i must tell he is not just tejpur professor he is a professor of media for the whole country from behrampur to tejpur several universities media education odisha and northeast uh, looks upon him and many youngsters from all over the country i have heard him three four times in my life i'm so happy and you look so sagacious sir with this beard and all that you look very sage on the stage sort of a image thank you thank you sir for being present thank you professor udwal and uma shankar a very good afternoon to all of you it's really a pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, uh, imcr um, india webinar series and share a session with professor thomas tufte as a speaker i, I am really uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me i am really thankful to uma shankar he talked a lot about me but the he the imcr ambassador in india who has been instrumental in uh, organizing this webinar giving all of us an opportunity to interact with the uh, globally acclaimed scholars like professor vasco professor murder professor uh, anna professor tufte and also professor benetta and um, uh, another thing i will tell about um, uh, uma shankar is that uh, we you see during this pandemic we all are participating because of the availability of the technology we all participate in uh, webinars and we uh, de deliberate and we deliver lectures and listen to lectures that we all do based on what we know till today but regarding uma shankar i will uh, I, i will have to mention this because he is very special what he did during this pandemic is i kept on learning newer skills whether it is about python whether it is about node excel whether it is about latex whether it's about uh, data journalism or data analytics he learned newer skills and then he kept on sharing those uh, uh, newer knowledge that you acquire he acquired 
um, uh, amongst all of us through webinars. So he's so motivating, not only for the youngsters, but also people like us who, who has been here in this discipline for the last 39, 40 years. But uh, I, I get motivated when I see Uma Sankar and his efforts. So thank you, Uma Sankar. And I hope you will keep on uh, continuing in motivating people and doing wonderful efforts like this. And regarding Ujwalji, uh, I, I have a very long association. Yeah, I don't know whether he remembers or not. I met him in 1996 at Manipal when he was leading the um, Institute of Mass Communication there in Symbiosis. Yes. And uh, um, it, what I found in him is his enterprising ability uh, as an academician and also as a, an institution builder. He is uh, he's not only a good academic, but also he has been instrumental in building uh, good schools of communication studies, whether it's Symbiosis, whether it's World Academy now in Atomos, and also in many other institutions in uh, foreign countries. So uh, uh, Udvalji has uh, contributed a lot. And besides his contribution to communication studies and research, what I will say, I am an ardent fan of his uh, writings in newspaper, his articles. His articles are uh, um, without any fear and fervor or prejudice and critical reflections of the social realities is that mirror reflections, so analytical yet without fear and prejudice, he writes those things. So I, I, am, uh, I love to read his articles and I am still waiting for his articles on uh, the new education policy and the pandemic. So um, uh, thank you Udwal Aji and thank you Uma Sankar. Now coming to today's um, 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 topic and uh, today's uh, um, speaker, Professor Tufte. As you all know, uh, Professor Tufte is a very senior scholar of communication, particularly uh, the communication for social change. And um, uh, but today's paper is uh, his talk is on mobile phones in uh, uh, everyday life and a case study of Rift Valley, Kenya where he will be talking about negotiating identities and uh, uh, social relations. Um, and life has started the we started the first uh, MA course in communication for development in a collaboration with the UNICEF in 2016. Since then, uh, people like uh, John Savage and um, Everett M. Rosers, Polo Freer and uh, uh, Tufte, uh, they are all very familiar name uh, to me and to my colleagues and also to my students. His book, uh, Communication for Social Change, is like a Bible to my students. They keep on reading uh, the text time and again. So uh, I am really thankful to Professor Tufte for um, uh, guiding us through his writings in the um, establishment of the course and also taking it forward. And Thomas started his, um, uh, Tufte started his uh, career as a uh, um, um, cultural uh, sociologist, particularly. He started as a development practitioner working with uh, UNESCO and the uh, Danish NGO that is Transcrade uh, and also UNDP. So for six years, he was there as a development practitioner. And then he started um, uh, joining the academics. He joined the University of Copenhagen, worked there since 1996. And then he joined Roskid University and worked for 12 years. So his academics started with the uh, University of Copenhagen. And as uh, Uma Sankar has rightly said, Thomas currently uh, is the director Institute of Media and uh, Creative Industries, Lower University, London. And he's... Uh, if we look at his studies, particularly his long-standing research uh, interests have evolved around two key areas. One is qualitative audience studies, where his major focus is on audience ethnographic research and communication for social change research, often at times combining both. His research interests uh, and supervisions are varied in nature. He, he supervised and researched on topics like media and conflict, media anthropology, communication for development, social change, and alternative media, and internet governance. And Thomas' current research supervisions, uh, this is very interesting to us because we are in India, and Thomas' current 
research supervisions are focused on C4 D in Brazil and alternative media in India. So his current research uh, programs are based on alternative media in India. He is currently co-editing also a book with Professor Taki uh, on communication for social change concepts to think with which is actually a part of uh, development of a global research uh, network of uh, scholars from 13 countries, all working in the field. And um, I will not talk about the Thomas uh, uh, Tufte's uh, led seven international research projects collaborating with World Bank, UNICEF, USAID, UNESCO, and many more where he worked in more than 30 countries all over the world. He has published three a monographs and 12 uh, um, edited books, and he has published about 60 journal articles, which we keep on referring during our um, uh, teaching and also during our research. And uh, the best thing is, he is not only publishing in English, but he's also publishing in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Danish languages. And he currently sits on editorial boards of many journals, about currently it's uh, sitting on seven editorial boards of seven journals, including Journal of Communication. And he's also an international advisory uh, board for a book series on communication for social change by Paul Gray. And about his uh, today's presentation that mobile um, phones in everyday life, uh, it is basically his engagement with ethnographic research is visible in, in all his uh, current um, efforts in research. Ethnography. Ethnography, as we all know, is deeply rooted in cultural studies. But uh, in the last two decades, ethnography has acquired a cultural <coughs> as a central role theoretically and also empirically in media studies. And uh, it also has acquired a rhetorical function. Rhetorically, ethnography has uh, come to represent on uh, um, opposition to positivist paradigms towards data collection and analysis, as well as the relationship between the researcher and the research. So that oppositional uh, paradigm to the positivist is the uh, premise basing on which the ethnography studies are based. And ethnography also represents a shift from the empirical practices of data collection to a more non-objective strategies for audience analysis and a greater level of self-reflexivity in the researchers. So audience ethnography is actually repositioned now. Audience ethnography, which is a newer concept, but it is repositioned as a fieldwork-based long-term practice of data collection and analysis. And it helps, as you all know, it, it helps the researcher to attain a greater level of understanding of the community. When it is an in-depth study, when it is a long-standing study, and you are associated with the research project in the field setting, and you are with the community you are researching for a longer, longer time, then naturally you, your level of understanding of the community becomes very high. And audio, uh, audience ethnography is uh, basically to understand the engagement process, uh, engagement process between the media audience users and the media products, taking into consideration the complexities of uh, location, and dynamics of gender, race, ethnicity, and also class. It's like researching the lived experiences of the communities and the audience, and how they situate themselves uh, in uh, political, social, cultural, uh, economic, and other social, social processes and spaces during their media engagement. And, they are, um, and today, as you all know, what is the importance of mobile? This, uh, mobile phone has revolutionized. And it has uh, truly made um, the dream concept of uh, Marcel McLuhan uh, that uh, the establishment of a global village, the smartphone and the mobile has truly uh, achieved a, a global village. And we take pride in the fact that when we use a mobile, when we have a smartphone in our hand, we consider ourselves not as a citizen of India itself, but also a global citizen with our participation in global processes, global thinking, global informational campaigns, everything. And we know that uh, the mobile, the smartphone, the internet users has become uh, to the tune of 4.57 billion people 
uh, of internet users we have in the world, which is 59% of the total world population. And particularly in Asia, we have 2 billion uh, users. And uh, as you know, it is very, very important for us here in India to listen to the uses of mobile and how it uh, helps us in establishing the identity and uh, deal with the social processes of our engagement and uh, the identity, whether it's individual, whether it's social, whether it's communitarian, all those uh, national identities or global identities, the mobile has uh, helped us a lot. And China being uh, uh, the, where we have, uh, we find about 934 million um, users, which is number one in the whole world, second coming India with uh, 696 million and third is states with 313 million. And what is more important uh, in today's violence during the pandemic, that mobile has uh, helped us a lot. The uh, um, um, online, this webinar that we are engaged in, it is because of the uh, smartphone, smartphone. Uh, I am also using a smartphone to take part in this webinar. So that has helped us a lot. And um, I'm happy to invite Professor Tufte uh, for today's presentation. And um, I really, uh, I am thankful to Uma and uh, um, Udwalji for giving me this opportunity. The uh, floor is yours, Professor Tuff. <clears throat> Thank you very much to uh, Professor Behera. Thank you very much for your kind words and also for adding some context to um, the topic of uh, today. I think that was uh, really useful. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to um, extend my gratitude uh, uh, first, firstly to uh, um, Dr. Uma Shankar for inviting me to uh, uh, talk today, but also to the university, to Adamas University and to the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor uh, who's joining us. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I think I'm really impressed. I, I sat in yesterday on Graham Murdoch's uh, presentation and just seeing all these faces and names and the interaction afterwards in the discussion. I think it's, um, it's, it's impressive what you've managed to set up and organize uh, for this whole week. So um, I'm happy to be part of it. And um, I think what I'm going to talk about today uh, is going to link quite well to uh, uh, Graham Murdoch's presentation yesterday, because he spoke about uh, virtual ethnography. I'm now going to disconnect us a little bit from the virtual side and uh, um, engage in a, in, a, in a recent project. Before I do that, I'm just gonna make sure I, I'm sharing my screen, uh, the right screen uh, with you, um, and also the right presentation. Uh, let me see, the, oops, yeah, that went too fast. Can you all see my, can you see my, um, my PowerPoint slides now? Yes, can, Professor Vigan, yes, Professor. We can see okay. you, your presentation and the voice, everything is clear. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, well, um, yeah, as uh, Professor Behera said, I'm speaking about uh, mobile phones in everyday life. And it's a little bit different from what I've been working on for uh, many years now, uh, which is um, around communication for development and social change. But then again, maybe not. Uh, and I want to explain what I mean by that, because um, we, we're going to talk about audience studies today and how people make use of their mobile phones in their everyday life. And um, for me, when we talk about communication for development and we strategize around how to use the media and how to use our different uh, technologies in articulating uh, processes of change, um, oftentimes I feel that uh, the, the work we do, the work organizations do, lack a little bit an understanding and uh, a, prioritiz a prioritization of understanding how their um, audiences or the groups they address actually make use of the, intervent the communication interventions. So I hope also by sharing today's uh, presentation, it can be also a contribution to the field of communication for development and social change in the sense that it adds some context and hopefully some insights uh, to how young men in a particular area, um, that's the Rift Valley uh, of Kenya, uh, make use of their phones. So I have this subtitle called uh, Negotiating Identities, Social Relations and Life uh, Aspirations. 
And I should also say when we heard uh, Graham Murdoch yesterday, he spoke, he had this uh, map, you probably, uh, those of you who, who listened to him yesterday saw the map of the world and the internet uh, connectivity uh, where you saw how much light there was in Europe, in North America and particular coastal sides of China and, uh, and so on. But you saw one big dark spot in the middle, which was Africa uh, with a very limited, uh, and as he said, Murdoch, uh, virtually uh, unconnected. That's still, I mean, largely the case that uh, the African, uh, in the, on the African content, the continent. But having said that, uh, some of my figures will also show um, more and more uh, Africans, and in this case, Kenyans, uh, do have a mobile phone. So um, I want to unpack a little bit what they do with these phones. So uh, I'm organizing my presentation uh, in uh, three main sections, and then I hope we'll have time for a good discussion. Uh, I saw also how active you were yesterday on the chat, uh, asking questions. So I hope we'll have, have time to accommodate uh, those questions. Um, first, I want to say a little bit about uh, uh, conceptually about the field of media ethnography that uh, Professor Behir also uh, made reference to. Media ethnography or audience ethnography. Audience ethnography obviously emphasizing that this is about how audiences make use of mobile telephony. But in today's world where audiences increasingly engage, I think media ethnography is actually a more appropriate term because audiences are not only receivers, they're also very much producers and many ways, in many interactive ways, engage uh, with the content. Uh, secondly, I will uh, present the project that this material uh, stems from. Uh, it was concluded uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. It's called uh, Critical Perspectives Upon New Media and Social Change in the Global South. It was a Nordic funded, Nordic Research Council funded project in collaboration with colleagues from uh, Eldoret, uh, Moy University in the city of Eldoret, which is about five hours drive out of uh, Kenya. It's the fifth biggest city of uh, the country. So uh, we collaborated with them around uh, a project. Uh, we, we, I say we, because we were uh, a total of 10 um, researchers engaging in this. I was a, a PI, but uh, we had colleagues from across the Nordic countries and Kenya engaged in the project. However, I'm going to speak primarily to my own sub project, which is called Livelihoods, Communication Ecologies, and acts of citizenship amongst uh, young men. So I'll, I'll give you an introduction to some of them, to th four of these young men, profiling some of them uh, as, let's, let's call them prototypes or types of men and types of uses of mobile telephony found in the material and in the communities uh, where I was conducting my media ethnography. And finally, I hope we'll have time uh, for some discussion, as I said. But before I, I engage with the conceptual um, uh, part of this uh, presentation, let me just quickly take you to um, uh, a, a small provincial town outside of Eldoret, where Charles, 22 year old Charles, he lives. He's a Boda Boda driver, which means that he uh, drives a motorbike, as you see on the picture, and uh, it, it serves as a taxi. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, something similar in, uh, in India. But, um, and this has really become, uh, has taken off in recent years as, you know, it's kind of replaced a lot of the bicycles that, uh, in, especially in rural uh, Kenya, was a mode of transport. Uh, and it's, and as part of that, um, that's called it technological development, replacing bicycles with motorcycles. We've also seen this proliferation of uh, young men, which uh, engaged with the informal sector in this way getting a job as, uh, a, as an independent uh, taxi driver, oftentimes, uh, but in this case also being, a, he, he doesn't own the, tax, the, tax, uh, the, the motorbike, it's owned by somebody else, who he then pays a sum of money every day to provide his services. Uh, with, you know, he can have one or two people on board and that's kind of it. Um, he lives alone in a small room, in a small one, I, you know, I went there, to, it's, a, it's a bed and a big sack of grains and a small table. That's what he had in that room. Um, and uh, there's no, no electricity there. And uh, 
what he does is not really uh, reconciling with what he wishes to do. He actually aspires to buy his own piece of land and make a living uh, as a farmer. Uh, but it's got a lot, he, he's a, a long way from that, uh, unfortunately, still. Uh, but uh, but uh, some of the money he does generate from his income as a, a taxi driver or a boda boda driver, uh, he does put aside, making savings, hoping one day to be able to purchase this piece of land uh, that he can uh, live off. But in his uh, work life, and I'm focusing on these four young men's work life um, in this presentation, uh, the mobile phone is fundamental. Obviously, to get customers, pretty much everybody, and you'll see some data in a moment, uh, pretty much everybody does have one sort of, one form of telephone, a mobile phone, not necessarily a smartphone, but then a simpler version where they at least can SMS. So he gets all of his customers by uh, SMSing with them. They, they send him an SMS and off he goes and picks them up or he finds them on the marketplace. But uh, the mobile phone is fundamental for his job. He does other things with his mobile phone, like playing uh, games on it. Uh, and he, as you probably know, uh, Kenya uh, is a pioneer in mobile banking. It's, I think, 13, 14 years ago, they started off with mobile banking, like 10 years before my country, Denmark. I think uh, mobile banking became something within the last five years in Denmark but they were truly pioneers in Kenya and they still are. They use their mobile phones for a very advanced, you know, paying their taxes, for example. So it's, it's, um, it's a technology that's uh, important and has been appropriated uh, in many ways in their everyday lives. He sends a lot of SMSs. Uh, many of them, as I said, have to do with, uh, with his job. And then uh, when it comes to other uh, forms of uh, mass media or media, you can see in his room, that's pretty much his home, you see there, he has a, a radio, but that's about it. Uh, TV, he accesses elsewhere on a, on a small hotel around the market uh, uh, square uh, in, his, in this small town. And he goes watching films in a video parlor. Uh, and then on his, mobile, on his motorbike, you can see these two rather large um, loudspeakers. So he listens to a lot of music uh, on, his mobile, on his motorbike. Uh, and other things. Um, but just to say that uh, to understand his, um, the role of mobile telephony in his life, we should also put it into this broader uh, communication uh, ecology. This, uh, you know, take this holistic approach that um, uh, Murdoch, by the way, also spoke about yesterday about the, the, you know, the, ho the holism of uh, anthropology as, uh, as a way also to understand that the mobile phone is not disconnected from the rest of the practices and media uh, practices of, in this case, Charles' uh, everyday life. That was just a taster. Uh, we'll come back to the, the other three young men and to Charles in a moment. But I want to say that this, um, this uh, positions itself, this type of study, uh, within um, media or audience ethnography which again has a history that goes back to, I would say, uh, James Carey uh, articulating the, the issue of uh, looking at communication as rituals in everyday life, and then trying to understand these uh, uh, rituals. Um, I think for that purpose, uh, ethnography is an excellent um, uh, methodological and also conceptual uh, approach. Um, you're probably all familiar with the history of reception studies that grew uh, primarily from the 1980s and onwards with Stuart Hall. I think, I think uh, Professor Behera mentioned cultural studies and uh, Stuart Hall was a key reference in that field, um, especially uh, his uh, seminal text originally from 1973, but published and widely disseminated from 1980 and onwards uh, called Encoding, uh, Decoding. And that kind of kicked off uh, the, uh, this change from only looking at texts in our media studies to actually looking at the reception, how people made sense of these texts. And you can say uh, that field developed uh, a lot in the 80s, very influenced by uh, cultural studies. Uh, and uh, I, I would say it peaked in the first half of the, of the 90s, actually, uh, and then somehow uh, um, lost momentum. 
But then we saw maybe to just mention one text, uh, Nick Coldry's text from 2004, articulating um, and drawing a, a lot on Latin American scholarship, by the way, uh, the need for a practice approach in media studies, I think marked uh, like a resurgence of audience studies. But now uh, approaching this from uh, everyday practices, we need to look at the practices of everyday life and what people do in these in their everyday life with the media. And the picture you see on your screen right now, I think is a good example of how entangled, you might say, uh, our media consumption is in terms of uh, looking at it from a practice approach. Here you see uh, two young men uh, sitting, you know, chatting to each other. So it's about, and it's after work, uh, it's uh, in the evening, so you can see it's about a relationship between uh, two friends, but then you also have this rack with a television set on it and a lot of other stuff, technology uh, under, uh, underneath, um, with uh, mobile phones lying around, re remote controls, music uh, rack and, and whatnot. So you have to kind of disentangle that uh, complexity to get a sense of what is then the particular role of the mobile phone. It doesn't stand alone. I think that's an, an important point to make. Um, and then obviously one of the research questions I have, I'll, I'll share all four of them with you in a moment, is how do these practices contribute then both to issues of identity formation, but also to issues around uh, community dialogue and uh, to connect it to communication <laughs> for development and social change, how, does it, how do they contribute to social action or what I call acts of citizenship as well? Those are issues that I will uh, come back to. So situated within media uh, ethnography um, and also within uh, communication ecology, a concept that, by the way, my colleague, uh, Professor Joe Taki uh, at, at Loughborough, London, where I am, uh, she has uh, theorized quite a bit upon and also worked uh, in Asia, including in India, uh, around uh, uh, this. Um, she's, she's developed a concept called EAR, e -A -R, Ethnographic Action Research, which um, tries to explore in a little bit more instrumental way or manner uh, the collection of data that give you a sense of people's communication ecologies. Uh, worth reading her work around EAR and communication ecologies. Well, one point that comes uh, with one consequence of positioning this type of audience study within uh, media ethnography we, within media ethnography and a practice approach is that we are social, social centric rather than media centric. Our main interest is actually not the media. Our main interest uh, are, are the people and what they do with the media. So this is about uh, identities, it's about social norms, it's about uh, social practices. Those are the issues uh, that are our main um, uh, research interest, but obviously the object that Kind of, or the you can say the the technology in this case the mobile phone becomes a pretext to understand processes of um, of identity formation and uh, and social action. Uh, and you might and another way of putting it again, Professor Murdoch yesterday talked about how important context is. Well, here I would actually go a step further and say we're making the context the text to put it frame it a little bit in uh, media research terms that our, what we're interested in, what is our main object of study are these uh, contexts uh, that we, that um, within which our media usage is embedded. I, a point I want to make also is I think we're living uh, a moment uh, of uh, rupture. Uh, it's, I might be delayed in saying that because uh, Arjo Napaderai a compatriot of yours, uh, he said this already back in 1996 um, in uh, his book on globalization, where he, um, he spoke about how we are articulating new subjectivities, I would say you might call it new, new identities, new subjectivities in a moment which he characterized as a moment of rupture, where the electronic media, uh, uh, mediatization or mediation, he called it, as well as uh, processes of migration were determining factors characterizing at that time uh, the moment of rupture. That was 1996, uh, before uh, most people had ever held a mobile phone. 
that's, that's uh, fast forward more than 20 years, uh, close to 25 now. And uh, I would say, we, we, I would argue that we're living a similar uh, moment of rupture in the sense that also was made reference to uh, by Professor Behira, the point that uh, we all have a phone. We don't all have a smartphone, but many of, uh, most of us, when I say us, even uh, citizens in, in, uh, in Kenya have uh, a mobile phone. But we need to really understand its role. We need to unpack and nuance what that means. But um, it is very important in most of our lives, the, the reference to the pandemic as well. For example, the reference to be able to participate in this session is another a good example mentioned. Um, so, um, but I think, uh, so, but in this moment of rupture where we're increasingly appropriating new technology, um, I think we all, uh, we, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot to be explored and nuanced in, in understanding and also digging deeper than some of the, let's call it the, um, the discourse, uh, the, the official discourse around positioning Kenya as a country of innovation. Well, I myself used the argument, they, they were pioneers in mobile banking. They definitely were, but let's, let's, let's travel into the rural areas uh, uh, outside of Eldoret and have a look at how that um, uh, how that looks. Uh, so it's about exploring these production, what I call production of locality. That's actually also in a Paderai concept from uh, way back. And then I use uh, the political scientist Isin, Engin Isin, uh, who has uh, theorized around uh, citizenship and what he calls acts of citizenship. So I'm in, you know, at the end of the day, one of my interests is how these phones uh, become um, uh, relevant and important in articulating acts of citizenship uh, of the everyday in the everyday life and of the ordinary uh, citizens. So and that becomes this this premise to better understand both processes of participation, let's say in public life, even in politics, in engaging with your community and so on, and a better premise to understand processes of, of uh, empowerment. I can already now reveal we don't come that far in understand in 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 this in the, when we studied the people we studied in in Eldoret. So I'll I'll come back to that on one of my last slides. Um, well, not going. I don't want to go too far into the the conceptual stuff, but the, just a couple of points uh, more, uh, starting from the back here. Um, uh, in a recent book that uh, Oscar Hema and I uh, uh, edited. Uh, I actually, if you want to see it, I have it here somewhere. This one, communication development and the cultural return. This one, what we actually did here, we uh, one of our colleagues, he uh, conducted an interview with uh, Arjuna Padurai. This was a couple of years ago, 2016, and making him also revisit some of his old uh, theories. Um, and uh, I mean, the notion of hope and the politics of hope became a framing reference both to that specific conversation and it ended up becoming it to a big section of our book um, in the sense that, uh, and also informing uh, uh, this work in the sense that we all come with aspirations to what we want to achieve uh, in life. Um, but of course, the a determining question is how we make those aspirations uh, come true. And in that process, what role do this, does this handful of mobile phones you see on the picture, look how different they are. These are young Kenyan men with different mobile phones. What role do, does the access they have to participate, to engage, to consume, uh, um, to follow news, whatnot, through that uh, technology, what role does that have in making this aspiration uh, become a real uh, you know, a manifestation of of their of their of their hopes, um, that's that's a, a kind of an underlying current uh, of questioning in this study. The notion of cultures of governance and uh, is a concept that I use from uh, a Mexican scholar called Jorge Gonzalez, who, in a Latin American context, is a very significant reference. He unfortunately doesn't have so much published in English, but he has a little bit. Um, but he does very interesting empirical work. Um, and he's developed this notion he calls, uh, he calls it cyber culture, but it doesn't have anything to do with computers. 
cyber meaning uh, Cooper, the, the Greek word to govern. Uh, Cooper, so the cultures of Cooper, of governance, is the way I've translated it uh, to English. So how, what are the cultures of governance existing in a community? You might say that's what's also driving some of this, uh, this research. Um, and what he does is he, uh, he unpacks, on one hand, uh, information systems. Obviously, these technologies are part of information systems. But secondly, also uh, communication practices. What do you do within this, this net web, you might say, of information systems? And finally, the third thing is what knowledge is produced in this community? So information, uh, information systems, uh, communication practices, and knowledge production coming together, weaving it themselves together in the practices of everyday life, um, and making the point that also if you, if you approach that also in a contextualized and even a, in a historicized way, you know, capitalizing on some of the, you know, the, um, uh, the trajectories of disposition that people and communities bring with them from the past, you'll get a, uh, you'll get a much more embedded analysis of how then to understand each generation of new technology. You know, we find many fascinating studies. Uh, I mean, going back to uh, Raymond Williams in the 70s um, and his, his concept of mobile privatization, for example, looking at how new technologies gradually are developed, you know, over the last hundred years from cars to mobile to smartphones and everything in between. You know, historicizing technology is an important point. And the Gonzalez comes with that in his notion of trajectories of disposition. And it's also embedded in his notion of cultures of governance. Um, yeah, I've, I've mentioned uh, Apadurai already, uh, but let me just read this quote from him where he, where he speaks about the capacity to aspire. He says, he said in that uh, conversation with a colleague of mine, that he can, I continue to struggle with precisely the question of how one moves from the affective and imaginative space of opened up aspiration to the exercise of voice in, let's say, political settings. So how do you move, how does, how does that transformation occur from actually, you know, getting a sense, you know, looking at a wonderful uh, program on TV or on your mobile phone connecting very much to your aspirations uh, of becoming whatever you aspire to, and then to actually uh, going out into your uh, offline life and, um, and uh, pursue those aspirations, exercising your voice. And in this case, he speaks about, uh, for example, in uh, political settings. And as we all know, mobile phones have, have had a, a lot of, uh, uh, space and a significant role in uh, many uh, uh, mobilizations. I know, I'm sure you can give many examples from India. And also, if you go, if we go back uh, some years back to 2011 with the Arab Spring and all those social movements and mobilizations that, although I would say wrongly, were called both Twitter revolutions and Facebook revolutions. I think we need to nuance that. But having said that, we know that uh, these uh, new technologies have had an important role in moving from aspiration to exercise uh, of voice. Uh, this study is also, uh, I would say, uh, you know, we, most of us were non-African scholars traveling to Kenya to do ethnography. It comes with a lot of limitations. It comes with a lot of issues you need to uh, unpack about being a non Kenyan, you know, a non local studying a local uh, community um, that you uh, have learned about, you might be experienced traveler, I mean, you might be uh, even knowledgeable in the language. But if you come, there are a lot of issues around that, that we can discuss afterwards. If, I mean, some of the questions raised yesterday, we can go back to some of those if, if, if you want around ethnography and, the, and some of the methodologies. Having said that, African audience studies um, in the digital era, I mean, it does remain a small field. Uh, I think it's uh, it's having its momentum, and I think this list of publications uh, shows that. So, um, from uh, some of the work done by Wendy Willems when she was living in uh, South Africa, with uh, Winston Mano from uh, Zimbabwe, I actually have that book. Also, you know, they have an an excellent anthology called Everyday Media Culture 
in Africa. So that's just that's an example with a lot of interesting uh, contributions. And where they also make the point uh, that's in the subtitle here of this slide about decolonizing, de-essentializing, <coughs> sorry, and provincializing uh, media studies and opening up for uh, the need to understand these um, uh, ways of using technologies and uh, media that uh, I'm also calling for uh, here today. Uh, another group, uh, research group um, based in, the, U in the, uh, the Netherlands with uh, De Bruyne, but also with Francis Niamjo, um, an excellent scholar, uh, anthropologist, I think, originally uh, from Cameroon, living in South Africa. They have an excellent project that's called The New Talking Drums of Everyday Life. And they got a second round of funding. Remember Murdoch yesterday talking about oftentimes, you know, you have very material limits imposed on you based on whether you obtain funding or not. But they got a second chunk of funding to develop the project um, around uh, cell phones and conviv conviviality. Uh, and out of that have come a, a number of studies. Um, uh, young scholars uh, doing work, uh, especially in South Africa, uh, under Niam Joe's uh, guidance uh, around uh, the use of, uh, of cell phones. I know at least of a handful of uh, books coming out of that, everything from MA uh, thesis to uh, doctoral dissertations being uh, published later as books. Uh, there's a, an excellent uh, Finnish uh, <coughs> woman, I forget her first name, Tenunen, who's done work around gender, mobile telephony and gender. And there's a Norwegian team uh, uh, run by um, um, an anthropologist. His name is Professor Joe Halle. Uh, oh, no, sorry, Hellevalle, Joe Hellevalle. And he and the team uh, worked in Botswana, in um, South Africa, uh, around um, this uh, project mentioned here called New Media Practices in a Changing Af Africa. But as you can hear, <clears throat> there are many uh, scholars based in the global north uh, coming with uh, funding. So it's still, I mean, I think some of the weak structures in the, in the African uh, uh, university realm to actually find time and money to work on these quite time-consuming uh, projects uh, is has been difficult historically, remains so. But I think I think uh, in African scholarship they they are experiencing uh, some momentum uh, or some growing interest and making an effort to do uh, these types of uh, studies. The last two are the uh, some of the uh, some of the research I've been engaged in. I was the principal investigator of these two projects. One was called Media Empowerment and Democracy in East Africa, where we looked into Tanzania and Kenya. And there we had two local PhD scholars, a Mexican, no, sorry, a Tanzanian woman uh, looking into uh, young girls' uh, use of um, uh, engagement in, in uh, uh, health campaigns. I'm not going to go into detail. So that was one project in Kenya and Tanzania. And then the one I'm talking about today, which is the last one that I have uh, flagged here critical perspectives on new media and processes of social change in the global south. So just to say, I mean, it's a growing field, but still not so big. This is just a, a slide on some of the publications that we have published from our study. So um, uh, from both these projects, actually, uh, some uh, books. The first one is a, the first one is a book, then a, uh, an ethnographic study of civil, what, I, what I call civil society uh, sphericules. Um, I'll go into the detail. And then uh, the book I mentioned before about where we uh, interview Apadurai and discuss this notion of politics of hope. But uh, most of the work um, from our 10 colleagues uh, has been assembled in two special issues of the Journal of African Media Studies uh, from 17 and from 19, 2017 and 2019. And uh, uh, my article uh, from 2017 is the one I'm drawing a lot on. Uh, and I'll, I think I can share this with uh, Uma afterwards, uh, in case you want Uma, uh, which is about, I call it the hustler lives and digital dilemmas uh, in Kenya. Young men negotiating work opportunities, life aspirations, and mobile use. So that's the one I'm speaking uh, uh, from uh, today, uh, not only, but uh, largely. What are the four research questions that are, or the questions that are driving, that have driven this uh, project with uh, 10 scholars in it? 
Well, uh, here they are. I mean, first of all, how are ordinary citizen, uh, citizens engaging with and con consuming media in these new media environments? And what patterns, uh, what patterns of everyday media practices at individual and household levels emerge in such contexts? So very much about um, these patterns. My focus is on these young uh, male individuals rather than on the households um, for your information. But our, other of my colleagues have been much more engaged with the whole household. Also with intergenerational issues between uh, in terms of who, who teaches who to use a mobile phone and how and the role of the mobile phone in a, in the context, in a, collect, in a context of male-female relationships in the context of intergenerational relationships in the context of household and community. Secondly, what are the implications then of the emerging everyday media cultures in such contexts on people's social and cultural identities and, uh, and their uh, local processes uh, of social change? Uh, I have two other questions. Uh, thirdly, uh, in what ways do rapidly changing media environments create or alter the existing spaces for citizenship engagement at local levels? And what are the implications of the emerging everyday media cultures in these areas on the propensity for ordinary citizens' engagement in politics? Uh, it, especially, especially one of these four young men I'll mention in a moment uh, can, can speak to that question. Um, Finally, in what ways and to what extent do new media and the patterns of ordinary citizens' everyday media practices, in what way do they challenge existing power structures and ordinary citizens' perceptions of and relationship with the state? So these are big questions to, to tackle if you're, you know, if you're focusing on one specific technology. But embedding it, I think, helps a little. So we'll, I'll come back to trying to answer all four questions at the end of my presentation. So the place we've been working uh, is, a, is a county in the Rift Valley uh, called the Wasingishu County, uh, which has a little bit over a million inhabitants, growing very fast um, and urbanizing very fast. Uh, it's got almost half of the population living in absolute poverty, 42% at the time. Or the, no, this is the data, the, the recent, most recent data we could get at the time. Um, it's the uh, Eldoret, which is like the anchor of the, of the study. Uh, uh, the fifth biggest city in the country is um, known for various things, but it's one of the things it's known for is it's the city of champions. So it's where all the, if you're interested in running, it's where all the marathon uh, champions uh, uh, from Kenya come from. They come from a small place uh, outside of Eldoret, um, so which is eminent. So they have about 10,000 runners uh, in that area. Uh, you know, they win all the, uh, many of the, even the Copenhagen Marathon is currently won by Kenyans. <laughs> um, uh, many of them are, are from uh, the Kalenjin uh, uh, tribe. Uh, um, but you also have uh, Luyas, Luos, and Kikuyu living uh, in this area. It's unfortunately also an area that has been um, hardly struck by especially the, the, the post-election violence in 2007 and the first days of 2008. So, um, and that resonates a little bit in uh, some of the work we did, uh, especially in uh, one of the, in the group, in a group of university students that were part of our, of our study. Um, um, and they were Luos in a context where they felt uh, very much a minority in the context of Kalenjin and Kikuyus. Um, it's also a place, uh, this county and this, uh, big city and also the smaller uh, uh, towns that we, we engaged with that's uh, impacted by what came after the, uh, the new constitution in Kenya, which is from 2010, which was a devolution process. So <clears throat> a political uh, devolution and decentralization to county level and even to city level. Uh, and with that came also, uh, and we experienced that, a lot of improvement in infrastructure uh, locally. Uh, finally, I raised the, I mean, there's the issue linked to the, uh, to this history of ethnic uh, violence, which had to do with um, <coughs> the uh, process in The Hague, uh, uh, around the legal process of prosecuting uh, 
some of uh, the people involved in uh, the ethnic violence. And um, given that uh, Eldoret was, uh, I would say, one of the uh, Kenyan uh, centers or epicenters for, for that violence, um, it also had a consequence which had to do with their, their way of viewing uh, foreigners. So it was extremely, so we came as foreigners to this area, considering that history, uh, doing ethnography. So it was very important having all our permissions, uh, uh, ethical clearances, going to the local chiefs, getting um, uh, permission to do field work, having all these procedures uh, in place and uh, being also introduced appropriately uh, to the communities where we were uh, working. We had uh, projects, eight of them, uh, covering six sites in both rural, peri-urban and urban uh, areas. I think I need to speed up. I hope to speak about 20 more minutes and then that gives us, well, maybe a little bit less so we get time for the, for the conversation. Is uh, that okay? You, you have to speed up a bit. You have to speed I up should a speed bit. up a little bit, yes. Yeah. So I'll try to um, do it quick. Yes, yeah, so we, we had these out, uh, eight different uh, projects uh, running um, and mine was one of them, Young Men's Media Uses. I've talked a little bit about some of the others. Let me just flag one thing from uh, this list, which was we did a household survey with 800, 800 uh, households, which gave us a good factual basis uh, upon which then to connect uh, many of these other uh, studies uh, that, we, that were of more qualitative uh, nature. My own study was <clears throat> focusing on young men, mainly in their early 20s. Uh, I uh, worked in uh, several sites, uh, six different sites. Um, they were uh, primarily low income, uh, except, uh, as I mentioned before, we also I also included a, a group of university students, and they were also of a slightly different uh, socioeconomic uh, profile. And what I did was uh, primarily, as I said, qualitative. Uh, I, did, I conducted eight focus group discussions with these young men, uh, uh, altogether 36 uh, young men, of which uh, a little bit less than half, 16 of them I conducted individual interviews. I did participant observations, for example, at the barber and seeing how they used media there. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, finally I did, uh, I reproduced the household survey we had done with my, with my uh, 36 uh, respondents. All this in the context of a, of a, of a place where uh, there's a massive uh, mobile penetration of 80, 88%, uh, even uh, uh, higher in the cities in Wasingishu. But if you went into the rural areas, slightly uh, lower, well, not still very, very high with 88% in the rural areas uh, having mobile uh, telephones. Uh, and uh, smartphones, however, it was significantly lower, uh, from 44% having smartphones in the cities to only 13% in the, in, the, in, the, in the deep rural outback, you might say. Uh, but very, very many Kenyans having, uh, were being mobile money transfer subscribers, a point I made uh, earlier in my presentation. So in that, in that context, um, uh, I engaged with these young men, where another point was that there was, uh, we found in our household survey, um, and that's part of this nuancing of these national data, um, a large uh, difference uh, gender-wise, and it was accentuated um, in the rural areas of how many men and how many women had access. Women generally having less access uh, to mobile phones. And it was most significant around, uh, around their access to smartphones. Uh, the same uh, gender uh, dimension came through around uh, their, uh, their uh, Facebook, having or not having a Facebook account. So far less uh, women than men having it. Um, and also, uh, well, when you look at what social media they were using, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp were uh, by far uh, the most uh, popular. So uh, coming to these four young men, I want to uh, briefly uh, say a little bit about um, what we find when we then engage with these young men in these in this variety of ways is a confluence of uh, lifestyles uh, of rural and urban uh, practices. We're going to see um, 
um, differences in both class, profession, in um, their geographic origin. And one thing that I did in my uh, individual interviews was I engaged uh, with their life histories. I tried to get them to, to tell me where they came from, their story of migration, and in that context, also the, the story of their media uses. When did they first watch a television? Uh, when did they first access a radio? And so on, all the way up to discussing their uses of um, uh, mobile uh, phones. Um, so the four men, I mentioned this, uh, Charles, to you first. Uh, and I've, I've given them all, I've kind of profiled them. Out of these 36, there are some recurrent narratives coming through. And that's what uh, justifies the way I've characterized, in this case, Charles, as the peri-urban casual worker, of which there are many. He's standing here with four of, the, four of his colleagues, and uh, probably most of them are also Boda Boda workers. So it's Charles to the right. Um, uh, so he was he was uh, um, um, a man also characterized, as I said, he was highly dependent on his phone. He had a very uh, casual type of uh, uh, labor, uh, and for him it was it was instrumental to have that mobile phone. Uh, another, these are all, these are all 21, 22, 23 year olds. Colin, I called him uh, the urban entrepreneur. Coming also, he was, an orf he was uh, orphaned early. He lives like the other, like several of the others. He lives alone in a room, migrated to this town. He's of mixed ethnicity, uh, left home as, as, as a 12 year old, moving away from his grandmother. And uh, he's a very dynamic guy. I mean, he, uh, as many of these young men, he, his teen years are uh, characterized by a lot of mobility, you know, looking for education and looking for jobs. Uh, both, of the, both, both of those issues come, come across in many of these young men's teen years. This uh, particular fellow, he was, um, he was smart in school and he also had, you say, energy enough to also uh, help others and he had some very clear ambitions around uh, supporting um, orphans in his hometown, uh, getting an education. I think reflecting his own uh, past. Um, and uh, one of his key mentors, uh, uh, no, sorry, one of his key role models, uh, obviously was, uh, not obviously, was uh, Bill Gates. Um, you can see here sitting in his room with, uh, with uh, all of his technology, he had several mobile phones, he had an, an iPad, and he was also running a small uh, company uh, with a couple of friends. So he was very entrepreneurial. Uh, and what they were doing, they, were, they had computer services in this small, this small digital hub of theirs. So they were, and they went out and took pictures also at weddings. They did a lot of um, things, but very much centered around those computers. Again, his, um, his mobile phone was instrumental uh, work-wise. Um, as you also see here, and that was another recurrent point, these values that he ca that came with him, for example, the emphasis on uh, education, uh, uh, are originated very much from not the parent, but the grandparent generation, in this case, from the grandmother. And that came uh, through a lot in these young men. Um, I went into the history of their uh, mobile telephony. You know, many of them got a SIM card uh, before they got a phone. Uh, they couldn't afford phones, so they had SIM cards. Then you know, swap each, you you borrow a phone, uh, and and there were many creative solutions to not affording uh, to have your own phone. Um, radio and TV access. There's also an interesting his, uh, history around that, which I think is important to also to also nuance how important um, uh, the mobile phone is. Because I would argue that it obviously we've seen uh, some significant uh, instrumental uh, roles played by the phone in everyday life. But if you scroll back, some of those we also found that in the radio, access to news, for example, and to tele and also with television, access to a, a whole symbolic world beyond your own community. So I think some of these impacts we look at uh, were also there uh, in, uh, in the history of technology as it, as it, as it evolves. So this is so Colin is a strong-willed, ambitious, and energetic, and 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 uh, successful 22-year-old. Uh, Peter is struggling a little bit more. I call him uh, the rural entrepreneur. Many uh, siblings from a small village, 
again left home early, uh, worked, uh, lived with his step uh, grandmother for a while. She was tough. He was uh, self-managed and self-financed uh, in a very early age. A little bit like the first guy I mentioned to you, Charles, uh, he, uh, he has this uh, rural uh, aspiration, which has to do with the uh, horticulture that he cultivates. Uh, however, he does have, and that speaks to also the role of uh, state companies in a country like, uh, like Kenya. I don't know if that might be similar in India. Uh, in this case, the military. But it could have been some of my other uh, uh, young men. They were very also oriented towards getting a job in a big state company. Why? Well, because it comes with, with job security and it comes with insurances. So there's a whole uh, set of benefits and services that come with getting a job in uh, state uh, companies. Um, so he would, he would do that. That was part of his plan. But like Charles, he had these rural life aspirations. Uh, another uh, point is this third last point about he was a new member of what's called a merry-go-round. Uh, these are safe saving systems where you come together and many, I would say the majority of people are part of a merry-go-round. A group of women, a group of young men, a group of these Boda Boda drivers uh, come together and they, they deposit savings uh, via their mobile phone in a joint box, which you know, then there every week it's a new it's a new member of the community who gets the saving. So it was a way to, um, and then you know, every twentieth week, if there were twenty, it would be his turn to get quite a big chunk of money to use for an investment in something. Um, he'd had radio uh, since uh, and you know uh, since childhood, loved TV, soap operas, and he'd had mobile phones for a decade. Uh, using using it very much also to check prices, um, market prices for his products, agricultural products, but also engaging in online betting, something that was was growing a lot uh, uh, at this point. Um, so also coming with the risk of you know spending your savings on the wrong thing. The fourth and final of my uh, of these uh, profiles is the more politicized profile. This a politicized urban professional out of a middle class background studying uh, in Eldoret, which is also not only known for its runners, but also for having 22 universities. So it's a city with a lot of uh, emphasis on education. So um, uh, traveling from other places to take your education in Eldoret. Um, so he was uh, out of, out of a, a strong uh, family unity, different from some of these other three boys I've just mentioned. He was very resourceful. He was from a different uh, ethnic background, um, uh, being a Luo, uh, a small uh, ethnic group. Uh, and um, he had taken on a number of leadership positions through school and through university. So the communities of belonging that he belonged to were both tribal uh, of nature were related to uh, what the internet could do, which again was related to the professional aspirations he had as a student of uh, media science. So he engaged a lot uh, and used, especially WhatsApp, a lot to um, make his opinions known and to engage uh, in, uh, in uh, debates in a, a range of politically oriented WhatsApp groups. So to, beginning to wrap up now, what are the findings coming through on these next, a couple of slides on that? I mean, the, <clears throat> except for the last one I mentioned, Mark, these other boys were first generation urban dwellers coming from these uh, quite fragmented, but still value quite strong on values uh, families where the grandparents in particular had a significant role. But also, as I said before, the teen years for many of these young boys were characterized by this pursuit for either education or for uh, income, uh, jobs. So that, that led to this mobility, but it also led to a situation of vulnerability, where, for example, uh, online betting comes in as something where you might think you can uh, um, pursue your aspirations, but you might end up uh, losing your savings. Uh, but still, values of discipline and hard work and respect passed on uh, from one generation to the other. Engaging a series of support structures like these merry-go-rounds, like uh, organizations, uh, like spiritual groups, like uh, or religious groups, like churches. 
but also the uh, communities of friends and colleagues be, being um, uh, support structures in a life that was vulnerable and low income. And finally, with a strong emphasis, uh, as hopefully the stories I've told uh, il illustrate, on basic needs, actually savings, jobs, land, uh, you know, very, uh, very basic needs that they were um, uh, pursuing. Clearly formulated aspirations across the across the board, and as I said, some of them looking towards government companies with benefits and stability. While Colin, for example, was much much more of a, was more of an entrepreneur, you know, risking it and uh, doing quite well. So uh, uh, life challenges being significant socioeconomic constraints, forced mobility. I've mentioned the gender uh, disparities. And then, uh, I mean, in this context, this negotiation of, on one hand, uh, some of the rural uh, identities, values, and rhythms, and on the other hand, being first-generation migrants, engaging and adapting uh, to uh, uh, urban uh, identities and values as well, linked to, the, let's say, the modern project. When it comes to media and communication spa spaces, embedded uh, um, very much in social relations and interaction. For example, this picture is from a video parlor where the, uh, especially men went and, and watched uh, films and sports. Uh, their use of social, uh, of, S of mobile phones, of SMSs, deeply ingrained in uh, their different social practices. So, and that's how we need to understand uses of, uh, of SMSs. Um, uh, reinforcing I think communities that they're already part of. So reinforcing uh, co collegial communities, reinforcing um, uh, uh, social communities, families and friend, friendship communities. So in that sense, you might say that this online offline distinction uh, might be a false uh, distinction often overemphasized because what the tele uh, telephones end up doing is more an extension of existing uh, stru uh, uh, structures in, in the communities than necessarily um, uh, a new one of the kind. So we also see these coexisting uh, uh, space, uh, spatialities, as I call them, where you meet and interact. It can be the barber where you read your newspaper and you talk, but it can also be uh, the WhatsApp group where you come together and discuss, and silence is forbidden, where you really engage and debate. But you do that in both, in, in both these. Um, you also have coexisting temporalities, as I mentioned before, around uh, uh, rural and urban temporalities. You might say, you know, stereotyping a little bit, but rural being slower and urban being more, uh, more intense and, and, and quick. Um, and it's also um, traditional times and modern times coexisting in the lives of these first generation uh, urban dwellers. So on one hand, to answer, so to answer question one, how are ordinary citizens engaging uh, with these uh, media and uh, what patterns of pra media practice do we see? Well, engaging very actively, uh, more on WhatsApp than on Facebook, but engaging very actively uh, and using it for a variety of purposes that have to do with their organization, both of time, of space, and of social relations. Secondly, also, uh, as I, uh, reinforcing existing and extending existing processes. Uh, that's processes of individualization, um, um, process of individualization of the media consumption, uh, and, of, um, uh, and to some degree also creating these new spaces that especially WhatsApp was doing, creating groups where, uh, where, where um, you know, either way you were betting together, where you're discussing politics together, or where you were playing together, for example. Secondly, um, no, still, no, there's still question one, uh, emphasizing the gender differences, uh, especially the access to the phone. I, I didn't uh, focus on that in my work, but as a group, we did. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so the, so the gendering of the media spaces, uh, and then, well, I've also men already mentioned the point about WhatsApp. Let me rush a little bit. Uh, question two, what are the implications of uh, of, the, of these cult media cultures on people's uh, identities and on local processes of social change. Well, it's, it's, it's evident that uh, text media, uh, SMS texting uh, was fundamental pretty much for all of them, uh, sending between 20 and 200 
uh, SMSs uh, a day. And clearly coming through in this presentation around their professional network, but also in their private, you know, maintaining contacts uh, with uh, other communities like family and friends, uh, this was uh, significant. Um, and you can say, uh, paraphrasing Manuel Castell, this might be an indicator of an act the actual existence of a, of a network uh, society. And also uh, paraphrasing, you might say, Anthony Giddens and his theory, uh, way of theorizing or conceptualizing globalization as, as time-space compression. This was actually also what, what I saw, this time-space compression as a result of these new forms of communication. So globalization playing out in their lives uh, uh, and their lives being uh, largely networked. Uh, so living in a network society, at part in, you might say on the margins of, but living in a network society. Uh, but, and also this indicator of pride coming through of owning a mobile phone. It's a typical, I would say it's a classical indicator of modernity and uh, the, the pride associated with a consumer product as a mobile phone especially if you have a, 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 um, a smartphone. Um, so yeah, as I say here in the slide, as the, an indicator of development, a marker of having become a member of or integrated into modern lifestyle, uh, an indicator of change. Yeah, so that, uh, but that of course can also be unpacked uh, far deeper uh, if we want. A third question uh, was about in what ways these environments create spaces or alter the spaces for citizen engagement. What I did see was some new forms of public uh, engagement in public debate, especially the university uh, student. He was very engaged and very much using the social media uh, on his mobile phone for that purpose. It also came through not in these young boys, but in uh, um, Kenyan MPs uh, and other decision makers using, creating these WhatsApp groups where they uh, invite uh, people to come and debate with them, but where they also share, for example, uh, uh, public documents, uh, documents from parliament uh, in their groups. So that also was a, an interesting way of connecting, of them connecting, uh, these young men connecting to, um, uh, to MPs in a new way. And suddenly having a much closer uh, or easier access to your local MP, that came through as well. And then the issue of accountability, holding these MPs accountable, for example, as a citizen. That, uh, I mean, that's, uh, especially uh, Mark had that uh, very strong on his, on his agenda. Um, and the others, and in our material, didn't really come to, these were very uh, ordinary young men uh, identified through some of our university students, going out into these communities, helping us identify young men in a particular age group, in low income areas. Um, so accountability and pursuing that through mobile phones uh, was primarily seen with, the, with the, um, the university students. Finally, I also mentioned already the ability to be up to date on your market prices, on what you're uh, selling, and as such, therefore an indicator on business uh, improvement, business uh, development. Lard, uh, lastly, uh, does it challenge existing power structures, these new media and uh, these patterns of ordinary citizens, everyday media practices? I think that's difficult to answer. I think it's offering new opportunities and that's what I've been trying also to document. Um, and uh, it, offer the, it, it creates these new dynamics that I've also uh, exposed here. Um, so in principle, they can potentially challenge existing power structures. And I think you have to see this also you know, over time. So ideally uh, long-term studies where you see that in moments of crisis, for example, it was mentioned, the pandemic was mentioned uh, in the introduction, in moments of political crisis as well, that's where I think these opportunities are articulated. What I was studying was a moment of relative peace um, and ordinariness, you might say, in everyday life. But the fact that they are there, these, uh, and they are socialized, these young men into and trained and developing skills using these um, uh, new technologies can offer this opportunity that at, at some point will be uh, put in use. So redefining relations to the state, uh, or especially to uh, decision makers. Um, 
and then as I write here, uh, opening for deeper questions relating back to the challenges for intervention. You know, if you're doing a development project of some kind, uh, communicating for development, and you want to enhance citizen uh, engagement. I think this type of uh, information can hopefully help you understand what dynamics uh, you need to tap into uh, to strategize around that. So I'll stop. Sorry, I went on and on, but uh, I hope we still have some time for questions and I'll pass it back to Professor Bahira. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tart, for your very brilliant presentation on the use of mobile phones in everyday life and uh, how it helps them negotiating their identities and creating their identities and also accepting their identities, be it individual, be it communitarian, and be it social, and how they develop their social relations, and uh, also uh, their aspirations, whether they have been able to um, fine-tune their aspirations with the use of mobile, and whether they also achieve uh, whatever they want to achieve in their life with this use of new technology. That was a wonderful presentation uh, talking about uh, the four uh, specific uh, uh, young persons, uh, whether it is Charles or uh, um, you have also talked about uh, uh, Colin. Um, or Charles, one very urban social worker uh, with a different uh, uh, background and Colin, the urban entrepreneur who is very dynamic and a uh, lot of uh, mobile phones and uh, as the, he is almost feeling empowered with the uh, mobile phones and radio, full access to radio and TV. Then you talked about Peter, rural entrepreneur, and all these four, and Mark, with different uh, social settings, in different social settings, uh, you have uh, given uh, a, a very good uh, usage of mobile and the um, whatever gratification they derive from the use of mobile or use of other technologies also. And the four research questions, yes, their engagement uh, was more, very active engagement with the mobile phone, particularly Facebook and Facebook and WhatsApp. And implications also, uh, you've talked about the uh, SMS, about 20 to 200 SMS and uh, how embedded texting have become a, a um, means of communication for them and owning a mobile becoming a sense of pride that's not only there in Kenya in even in uh, many other countries even in the rural areas where um, poverty stricken people live particularly in India they also take in pride of having a mobile or having a smartphone that sense of pride is all not only new to Kenya but also uh, to many other countries and uh, the purchase of a mobile uh, is seen as an indicator of development. Now here in India, I was talking about the use of mobiles and uh, why there is a, an um, enormous um, rise in the ownership of mobiles and the use of mobile, the smartphones, because it has become much more affordable. When in 2007 and during 2007 to 2013, there's a Reliance Geo, a company which has brought in very cheaper uh, mobile phones and also the cheaper data. The data has become almost 95% cheaper in India. So that cheaper data, speed of internet and the affordable price of the mobile, that has helped uh, in the um, huge increase of ownership of mobiles uh, in India. And uh, that is also Kenya, though uh, it is a little different. Uh, you said that your, when you did the project, it was 42% of the people are very poverty stricken and uh, electricity is not there. Uh, slowly the uh, infrastructural development is taking place. The world is changing and we uh, expect it to be uh, changed for the better. Thank you very much, Tuff. But we have a very uh, few questions that uh, uh, I would uh, like you to. Sir, we, with, with your permission, sir, uh, there are two questions we would, uh, uh, want to ask them directly. One is Dr. Manoj Das, and uh, the other.
the other is dr fatma al al zahra al said from egypt so with your permission sir uh, if you could allow uh, these two people to ask questions directly sir yeah then the, they can go ahead with their questions after that i will uh, yeah sure uh, right right questions. so dr manoj yeah. das first please unmute yourself and ask the question dr manoj das and after that dr fatma al said are you online dr manoj das i think the host will need to unmute maybe because uh, that was her, uh, uh, all, the host uh, the host please unmute uh, uh, you know manoj his screen name is manoj dad manoj dad and the other is uh, fatima al zara al said yeah. so on the screen it is manoj dad m o yeah. manoj d a d yes yes unmuted now yeah i think we can hear you now Yes. Yeah, Manoj. Manoj, we can hear you. Yeah. Please go. Yeah, I think it was very inspiring uh, talk, uh, Doctor Tafte. In fact, uh, your paper, old paper on uh, where you worked, or your, uh, where you uh, wrote with uh, 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 your colleague uh, Ben Stan. Uh, yeah. I think uh, where you talked about Anna's use of radio and Yarhar's use of uh, you know uh, the telenovela. and despite uh, the fact that uh, uh, yarhar never uh, liked the novela he always you know used to watch it with his uh, uh, girlfriend because he wanted to uh, integrate himself with the larger project of the family so what you emphasized uh, i think in that paper was very illuminating you try to say that uh, it's not the content which is important but it's the ritual role of communication Uh, how communication actually uh, and how the use of media actually helps uh, individuals get integrated in the society i was wondering whether this project of yours the use of mobile technology in kenya whether you could also extend the same idea here i mean how would uh, the use of mobile uh, integrate the society in a ritual sense thank you very much that's a very interesting question and thank you for bringing up that old point from my work with uh, brazilian soap operas um where i did and i did underscore the point to, about uh, how rituals are uh, emphasize social relations rather than uh, um social relationships like uh rather than uh, the actual content of a television program so it was important it was more important to be in the sofa with your girlfriend and uh, you know hanging out with her and her family then what what was on the screen i mean to put, to kind of paraphrase it a little bit in this case where the focus is on mobile telephony i i mean to give maybe um, a couple of examples i think they um, one would be gaming i mean but that's again you know uh, doing something with your friends the ritual of playing a game on mo- on on your mobile um it's maybe more important uh but then i would say we did, I, uh, maybe some of my colleagues have i don't have that level of detail on their use of gaming that would be the the similar hypothesis uh-huh. at the, it's the ritual the global uh, women it's the ritual of uh gaming um that be, that is much more about friendship than about playing a game and uh, you might say similarly uh, around um um that i we did see around some of the political groups uh, around mps setting out things student leaders set, setting out uh, setting up groups uh, on whatsapp so um um yeah i think some of the theory around the ritual use of 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 communication comes could come could be used to explain this especially in in smaller communities where you you can say you might almost be expected to be part of of those groups Uh, to the, uh, so in that sense you can you can make some parallels having said that it's maybe a little bit more difficult uh, to study this because especially because of the individualized uh, nature of the cons- of the media uses so um, you might say what i came the the level of analytical depth that i achieved here i should i would need more time to go the the, the layer deeper to understand 
for example, the, the picture I showed you in the beginning of two boys, I explained it brief, two boys sitting in the living room and with their mobiles and remote controls around, but then watching a TV program. Did you see that? So unpacking that, that specific picture, maybe it will be much more about friendship than about the particular TV program that we're watching. And it might be much more about, um, yeah, about friendship. So thanks for your question. I think that it's a, it's, I think it does count also in Kenya and it does count also around mobile telephony, but I don't have maybe the, the analytical depth to really make the same parallel to Yerar back then on soap operas in Brazil. With, with the chair's permission, I invite my friend, Dr. Yeah, yeah, Fatma yeah. Al-Zahra al mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Uma for this uh, very interesting uh, webinar series. And also I am uh, very happy to uh, have this uh, presentation with Dr. Thomas uh, for uh, his informative presentation about Kenya and his project. And uh, my question uh, is about uh, uh, this, this project, how much he is convinced to what extent he is convinced that this uh, uh, this border border driver that we can realize millions of him in, in our developing countries really can use the mobile the phone or the mobile technology to improve their level of living in time in a time that uh, uh, the political corruption and the economic problems the unemployment high rate of poverty in the uh, developing countries are really pressing hmm. so this is yeah my question then. I think that question can, I mean, it can be answered on, on various levels, I think. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think one level of answering is maybe, uh, is about in his, in, in his everyday life as a, as a boda boda driver, uh, to make that job function, to perform that job function, the mobile phone is fundamental. And in that sense, you can say um, it does earn him a living. But in the article that I'm, I'll share afterwards, you'll see it earns him a, a hopeless, you know, a poor living, uh, which speaks to the second level of your or level of your question, which has to do then how how can he then improve, for example, a job security, uh, organization of of boda boda drivers in associations, maybe in trade unions, in um, and find at least some platform whereby they can articulate some of their uh, work conditions. I think that um, was not the case. And I think maybe it's, uh, uh, I don't know, in part because it's a, it's a very young profession still, but that's probably not the only reason. You know, it's a very young profession in, in uh, these border border drivers, been around for maximum five years at the time we did our study. Um, but you're right. It, uh, uh, how do you how do you cater to to some of the uh, types of jobs that these young men are engaged in? And I mentioned the point about the role of state companies, because they do offer. I mean, almost independently of what you're doing in that state company, they do offer you uh, security in the job uh, and a series of services, health services, even educational services, training services, even to your children. So a lot of benefits getting that type of employment. And being out there as an entrepreneur or as a boda boda driver, um, uh, you are in a in a much more vulnerable uh, position. So I take your point. Uh, you can then say that you know he can engage with his, he could engage with his MP in the WhatsApp group that the MP has locally, mm -hmm. and there argue his case. That's technically possible. Uh, in uh, in Charles's specific case, he wasn't a member. Uh, but maybe some of the other boda boda drivers were. So there is that opportunity to, to pursue this second level of your question. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uma? Dr. Behra, you can continue. We're thank you, thank you. you, thank you, sir. Apologies for coming in, sir. Thank no, you. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, of course, we do not have many, uh, we have questions. Uh, this, this one is from um, Professor Tafte. is from Nisa Power. She is from Kolhapur University, and uh, she has two questions. Where she talks about uh, whether mobile, the use of mobile, is closely related to the theory of uses and gratification, uh, the use of mobile and the gratifications by Liu Kach. And secondly, she is also uh, asking about the social life of Kenya. 
and whether uh, mobile is playing um, the role of narrowing the social gap that exists in Kenya, whether mobile can be a tool of narrowing or bridging the gap that is evidently um, visible in Kenya. This is from Misa Power, Professor Tufte. Thank you very One much. Is user and gratification. Second yes. is, uh, yeah. Social life in, uh, in yeah, Kenya. Yeah. Now. yeah, the use and gratification. Yes, I think uh, to some degree, uh, I didn't mention that. I had that slide where I started with James Carey and I ended with uh, Nick Caldry, kind of, yeah. with social with uh, media practices. But yes, I mean, um, it lies in that tradition. I would say uses and gratifications, you know, like James Lull's, some of his work from the early 80s, he kind of grew out of that tradition and he became a, a key reference in early years of media ethnography. Uh, there's a direct link back to uses and gratifications. Uh, I would say uses and gratifications per se, um, maybe lack some of, uh, some of the um, uh, depth that uh, the more ethnographically oriented uh, methods uh, allow to move into questions uh, of identity of uh, social dynamics and relationships, um, questions of, of aspirations. So I think, um, I mean, there's a functionality associated with the uses and gratifications tradition. And I think media ethnography brings that, uh, maybe a, if I may say so, a step further in the way of, of, um, of, of deepening our understanding of, of some of these other uh, issues I mentioned. To your second point about social life in Kenya, I was making the point in my presentation about mobile telephony uh, rather extending uh, existing uh, structures and ex existing um, relations uh, to colleagues to, um, I'm not sure they, uh, in that sense, narrow the social life. Um, if you by that mean that people come more together uh, uh, online, um, I would, you know, television, we access the same symbolic worlds on television, the same TV series, be it uh, Kenyan or Indian or, or Danish. Um, and in the same way, you can say we can access similar symbolic worlds on our mobile telephone, the same games, the same betting services, the same politicians. Um, but I, would, um, I wouldn't go so far for, uh, I would say, uh, socioeconomic reasons to say that it's actually narrowing uh, the, the social life. I, I wouldn't take it that far. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Professor Tufte, but I have also a certain uh, clarification to, uh, to get from you. If you look at the first research question, somewhere you talked about uh, how the ordinary citizens are engaging and yes. consuming media in the new con media environments. Now, normally when we talk about users and gratification, uh, do you believe that uh, we use media or we consume media? Because when we become consumers of media, it's somewhere it is uh, leveled or uh, talking about technology overpowering men and the commercialization of media. But when we talk about use, we become a little more powerful. The audience become more powerful. We can be choosy and the control is in the hands of the audience. We use the media as per our convenience, as per our needs. So what is your take on this using and consuming the media? I, please, Professor Tufte. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I recognize that these concepts, they, each, they come with each their uh, baggage, um, yes. conceptual uh, baggage uh, uh, when we say con consumer or consumption or user and use. Um, and then we have this new vocabulary emerging uh, like uh, prosumer, where you, yeah. where you, for example, where you see um, like a re revisiting audiences or users or consumers from the, based on the premise that we can actually also produce content as as um, as owners of a telephone, as a, of a mobile phone. My, I, I think uses the, the social uses of mobile yeah. telephony for me uh, um, is allows you, as you say to um, uh, both, I mean, going back, for example, to James Lull, and he had, a, he, it's, a long, it's a long time gone, but he yeah. had a very interesting article back in the early 80s about the, I come, which grew out of uses and gratifications, 
but I think still it has a lot of uh, validity where you talked about the social uses of the media in structural uses and relational uses. Uh, and I think we can, we can see that, uh, we can reach, utilize that approach in, uh, in, in, this, type of, in, a, in this type of analysis. That's, so I would go with, the, with uses, but I would recognize that this, we need a new vocabulary to understand these complexities. And you know, we are on the road of yeah, towards yeah. that. With Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, we also have a question here from one Sapneel. He talks uh, in terms of uh, the digital divide. And he, his contention is that whether this mobile communication technology can be used to bridge the digital divide, particularly in African countries, and more particularly in Kenya. Is it a new cultural capital? Can we consider this mobile technology a new cultural capital? Um, I think my short answer would unfortunately probably be no, uh, but I, let, me, let me qualify that or let me nuance that because I think uh, we deliberately designed our study in a, in, a, in, a con in a part of Kenya, which was far away from the capital city. Yeah. So, uh, and not even did we go to a smaller town uh, or a smaller city, we went into the neighboring communities and even into the rural areas. So we were far from uh, Nairobi, the capital where there's much more going on, internet services are prolific, uh, and uh, easy, uh, easy to access, the, connect the connectivity is much better. All of that yeah. infrastructure is much better. And in, in that context, in, I would say uh, to some degree, yes, the, it can bridge the digital divide. But having said that, I would all, uh, you know, we found a lot of issues around, uh, as I've talked about gender, but I haven't talked about connectivity, but that was also a big issue. Yes. Um, I think when, it, when, we, when we introduce a new technology, we cannot mm. disconnect it from people's, for example, levels of education. So mm. your ability to, to operate um, uh, a mobile uh, telephone, yes, you can be tech savvy in getting an SMS across, but I think there's, uh, there's a lot more, if you take the university guy, Mark, and his ability to engage on the telephone, it's not only because he's more tech savvy than Charles uh, or Colin, it's also because he's a university educated young man. So he has, I think also the, the, some other skills. So unfortunately, I think um, sometimes technology also reproduces existing divides and we have to be attent to those uh, social, um, uh, in this case, educational uh, divides as well. But um, it's a difficult, so I lean to the no, it's not a new cultural capital, but it comes with, uh, with you know, yeah. some nuancing. Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, the next question uh, is about, uh, when you said about the context is the text. It's not the text that is enough, but the context that also at some times uh, recreates the text and it derives different meaning. And here is SR Sanjeev from Kerala what he talks about, what he questions. Ah, sorry. Uh, just a minute, there is a little. Shall I? Uh -huh. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I will see later on, but I, I am asking the question, though I am not visible. That's okay. Entry of social context and imaginations appropriate the context itself. And while constantly using the term social change, are we really identifying the voices of the said social settings or communities? And are we addressing the agency or lack of it in the said communities? He talks really about the context first and um, whether uh, the social context and the imaginations appropriate the context and with the technological entry and whether the social chain that we are talking about it is really for identifying the voices of the social settings and communities or are we addressing the agency or lack of it in the set communities this is what uh, Sanjeev had said is it clear Professor Tafte? yes it is and it's a good question because I think yeah. uh, when we embarked on this project, 
uh, you know, we had coming from the global north, you know, engaging with discussions of communication for development and social change. We were very uh, <clears throat> adamant on wanting to, to find agency, you might say. You know, we were wanting to look into how these mobile phones were produce were articulating a lot of agency. And, um, but maybe what we found was not really the type of agency we had expected. Back to, uh, was it Fatma's question about, you know, how to address these underlying structural problems of economic crisis and corruption, and et cetera. I think the point made now in this question about, yes, I think we've ident we have listened to, in my case, 36 young men, but we've listened to 800 households and my uh, nine colleagues have done all their studies. And I think we've collected a lot of voice from community settings. And we have identified forms of agency that have to do with improving your life condition here and now, but maybe less so identifying uh, the, the agency that might address the underlying uh, contextual, let's call them inequalities or constraints around that all you know that are that are um, evident in these marginal uh, poor areas. We didn't find that. So um, yeah, it's we've identified uh, voices and you might say forms of agency that might not go far enough. But also and maybe let me leave on answer with that uh, end with that opportunities. So potentially this can be used if you orchestrate if you are organize it can be used and abused for social change purposes, you might say. Yeah, uh, thank you. A very good, interesting question from uh, Dr. Alfari Dusen, a teacher in Assam University. He talks, uh, is ethnography and ethnomethodology the same? And if visual ethnography, like photo elicitation or photo voice in a community would elicit a more robust nuanced findings or what we call think thick description. I don't know, uh, thick yeah. description. Ethnography or ethnomethodology are the same thing. And he talks about visual ethnography like photo elicitation and photo voice in a community. Okay. Yeah. I think, yes, thank you. I'm just taking notes. Um, I think if, to the best of my understanding, ethnography is is much broader uh, and, uh, than ethnomethodology. And it's yeah. also, you know, it's, it embeds you deeper into the community that you're studying. Yeah. And I, and then when it comes to uh, was, yeah, but photo voice and visual ethnography, um, I agree, you know, it, that, that's an interesting um, technique or uh, method to um, explore. It, I think it, it can provide some richness for example, the visual ethnography. Had I had a camera when I did my when I did my um, uh, participant observation, had I been granted, you know, uh, access to filming my uh, Boda Boda driver when he was interacting with his colleagues, or my uh, university student when he was uh, with his colleagues, I, I think a visual ethnography definitely uh, adds um, another layer of uh, information, of access to this life world of theirs, um, and to uh, what was suggested, uh, the Clifford Geertsian thick description, um, definitely. But uh, I would say it cannot, it, it cannot come alone. Uh, visual ethnography, I think, um, uh, adds this, uh, the layer, but the filming in itself, I think is, um, yeah, it has to be uh, contextualized in, um, in a, in in a in a broader set of techniques, so I wouldn't go with it alone, but I, it definitely adds to the thick description. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now the last question uh, is by Subankar Basu, again from Sikkim Central University. What he <clears throat> talked about: Does smartphone usage affect viewing preferences compared to TV and challenge? ritualistic peers in lower economic groups, particularly these disadvantaged sections, whether this uh, smartphone usage um, affect viewer preferences. Interesting. That's an interesting question. It's about the causality yeah. between one technology and the other. Yeah. I think, um, um, I, yes, it definitely does. 
because on the smartphone you will access, let's say, an on betting ser service, or you'll access a gaming uh, service, or you will access uh, Facebook pages or Instagram uh, pages with your role models and your, as you know, your fan, the, the celebrity. So I think all of that world of engagement or your political preferences. I think will also spill over into uh, how you uh, use these other technologies. I think that also speaks to this uh, interconnection, the communicative ecology that you live in uh, signals, that whole no, uh, co concept and notion signals that these are very interconnected. So what you do on one technology definitely um, influences and affects what you do on another, on another device. So, um, but it's a good question, um, but yes. Especially, and it was the question was about smartphones. If yeah. you have a more basic phone, less so. But obviously, with a smartphone where you have access to the internet, there there would be a lot of uh, interconnection there. He also needs a little clarification when you talked about uh, the implications. Uh, you've talked about the implications on gender, about the usage of phone. Now he says, what are the implications on gender receptions? in regard to reading the texts and cinema, viewing cinema, TV, and can it affect the political settings of a patriarchal order? He talks about the gender implications um, of the usage of uh, uh, mobile phones on receptions. And also he talks about, can it change the political settings of the patriarchal order? I think the patriarchal order is part of the explanation for the gender disparities that we found. You know, you can, to some degree, explain them in patriarchy. You know, who decide, who, uh, who gets, we can afford one phone in our household, who's going to have it? So, you know, it probably will be the man. Uh, so I think that, that explains to some degree uh, what we found uh, in our, you know, the difference between man and woman. When it comes to, um, but I think it's a good point raised here that um, it, uh, the fact that you, if you especially have access to a phone with a uh, internet access, and as I said, access to these other symbolic worlds, I think, it, first of all, it, you can connect uh, you know, to these other spaces, you can see other role models, other representations, but you can also interact with your friends. So you can also talk to other, your friends over distance, um, and in a much more dynamic way, I think that combination of new representations and new dynamics of friendships and, and uh, will, will potentially um, uh, benefit the woman in the sense it will empower women. I, I found that in previous work uh, around migrant communities in my home country in Denmark, uh, where young women got a strong sense of, of empowerment through their mobile phone use. And I'm sure, um, but are you, I would have to ask my colleagues in this study yeah. on how, how far they came in that. But my answer would be yes, it, it, would, it could in, definitely influence gender uh, relations and ultimately, you know, uh, claims or political settings as was asked about. Yeah. Dr. Behra, we have to bring the session to an end, it's two hours. And this is what? the last question, Professor Chaudhary, uh, I know. Already five o'clock and uh, we yeah. have to... If Thank you, you very much, Professor no, Tufton. Dr. I will Bera, not take much could, time. Yeah. You, you take a couple of minutes, Dr. Behra, to bring this, uh, to summarize from your end. You know, some uh, okay, take it okay. from your end. Okay, okay. Uh, well, Professor Tufte, I am really grateful to you for bringing in this uh, conceptual approach of media ethnography and communication ecologies, and where you talked about the, uh, it's about socio-centric rather than media-centric, and what I liked is making the context the text. Naturally, we, we always talk about the contextual usages and making meanings out of not only the text, but the context. But here, that has been in media ethnography, the use of that, and that leads to a deeper and better understanding of the mobile phones in everyday life. Now, this is an area uh, which perhaps we are not looking at in India, because the situation here in India today is little different from what was what is there in Kenya when you did the study. And uh, mobile phone usage is there in our country, it's gaining ground. But again, for the very different purposes, if I uh, take the case of the pandemic now, suddenly mobile phone, the smart 
phones are much in demand for uh, educational purposes. Right. Earlier, it, it was for informational, their entertainment, this was a, uh, a possessed medium. And some studies have found out that the, um, normally the young people use it to navigate uh, from their parents and uh, have a secret uh, um, um, communication aid. Um, but today, oh, oh, the mobile has become a panacea for all sorts of information and uh, communication, particularly the COVID-19 and education is a newer way of educating people, educating the students because they are far away from their um, 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 universities and colleges. So mobile is, uh, the use of mobile uh, has become very, very important in today's pandemic uh, days for educational purpose. And uh, uh, your presentation was uh, really very um, important for us. And for we academicians and researchers, we will certainly look into the this kind of research, the ethno audience ethnography or media ethnography, or which uh, arises from the concept of media engagement uh, instead of using and um, uh, consuming or uh, presuming. Uh, how do we engage ourselves if we um, with the media? So a lot of studies certainly we will be thinking about uh, by using this audience ethnographic uh, methodology and uh, the media ethnographic methods. There are, um, it was quite a uh, very meaningful um, session for all of us. Thank you, Professor Tufte. Uh, and um, we would love to see you in our department because my students have been reading your text. We have been reading and teaching from your text. Sometime, uh, uh, if you permit, we will be very glad to invite you to my department here in Tezpur University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now very much. over to yeah. Udwal yeah. and Uma Sankar. Thank you, Dr. Behra, for a very uh, perceptive comment. And yes, we would look out, we would wait for listening to Dr. Tafte once again. Some of the key things, just for the sake of, there are three media organizations which are covering this program. They are, their representatives are already there in the audience. And as a part of my duty, as well as one of the hosts, co-hosts and co-conveners, I'd like to quickly in a minute summarize some of the key things that Professor Tafte has brought forth before us. He has taken up the concepts of media cultures, media ethnography, media landscape changing, and therein moments of rapture. Very beautiful concept, moments of rapture, rapture. rapture. Uh, cultures of governance and trajectories of disposition. So these uh, and how politics of hope are also emerging. And in all these concepts or all these contexts, role of mobile telephony, how exposure, watching, sharing, gathering, all of these leading to aspiration to exercise of voice. For initially with aspiration and to what extent is it leading to exercise of voice. He has gone into the case study in Kenya and he has talked about African audience studies in the digital age. How is it decolonizing, de-essentializing, and provincializing? And in that context, the new technologies usage. Implications of everyday media cultures and people's identities and social change. He has taken up that as well with an example with a detailed case study, how uh, these implications are emerging. Good comparative study among mobile and smartphones usage among males and females and among urban, peri-urban, and rural backgrounds. We call in India, mafasil and semi-urban. I, I enjoyed the term peri-urban being used here. Fragmented and yet strong family values. The study shows one one side fragmented cultures and on the other side, yet strong family values. And I like the uh, perspective that grandparents' values being taken over, uh, being retained. Mobility and vulnerability simultaneously of the studied groups uh, of Kenya. That's another important point. Embedded, creation of embedded spaces, you know, the, because of the new technology. SMS, WhatsApp, video parlor, and online, offline continuum. The other aspects that came out through the study, silence being forbidden. And citizen engagement, where aspiration to actual articulation of voice and action coming up through the use of the new technologies. Uh, that the, in the question answer, the discussion on whether mobile technology is a new cultural capital 
or a tech tool or a facilitator that's another interesting aspect of the yeah. discussion and prosumer producing consumer this is uh, particularly in social media age prosumer is a reality of the times today and what dr behra has mentioned media engagement is more important than just media consumption and if we look at only consumption then what comes is a plethora of fake news that we see today through the mobile through the whatsapp particularly uh, through the whatsapp route this discussion is very important and significant in today's context as dr behra has rightly said uh, web education web entertainment and web networking these three have become extremely and even web based business uh, on digital business online business and online consumption ordering e retailing all of these have become very significant in times of covid and people's habits are changing to such an extent that we look forward to blended education blended entertainment and blended marketing in times to come and mobile being at the base or ground or center or core of all of these thank you uh, dr thomas tafte for a very engaging interesting and case study based discussion that you had everyone please join us tomorrow at 9 o'clock i'm sorry 3 p.m 9 is the gmt sign <laughs> Uh, in hours 3 pm uh, the gmt is 9 and, and i'm sorry for that you are in india yes i am in india but there are yeah. many people from other countries i must note that there are many people from other countries also yeah here. yeah that's good uh, uh, and, and 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 i appreciate uh, them joining us here and tomorrow again the last session and we expect all those who have registered so far to once again come in tomorrow for those who are asking about the e certificate we shall have the e certificates being given after tomorrow based on the registration records so i request everyone to join tomorrow uh, at the right time 3 pm for the last but never the least discussion that we shall have all tomorrow tomorrow yeah. we have dr benedetta breveni the associate professor from university of sydney so we are continuing with our uh, series on qualitative research methods tomorrow she'll be speaking on communication policy research uh, policy research use of qualitative interviews Very so good. Uh, from denmark to down under australia will be uh, you know uh, going to the other part of the world looking forward to having everyone tomorrow back again we would invite professor tafte uh, once more if he can tomorrow and professor tafte you'll have to come back to india online and offline again and again uh, thank you behra sir once again thank you ujjalda for everything you know for putting up this wonderful show yeah, thank USP, you usp usp it is so interesting we started from russia we went to us we went to uk <laughs> Today we are at Denmark, and tomorrow we shall be in Australia. Yes. And sitting in India, we are getting them all here. And I see the USP of USP. He takes us around. Yes, yes, he takes us around, no doubt. Uh, yeah, he, is yeah. the, he is the IMC ambassador, after all. Yeah, yeah. He is the international true. ambassador here. And, Thank you very much. And interestingly, there are in this program itself friends from Egypt, friends from mm. Africa. Uh, the speaker okay. is from denmark several friends from different parts of india bangladesh nepal i have seen this much philippines as well philippines philippines so i yeah. I, i really appreciate the energy and interest of everyone and let's meet together 3 pm tomorrow with this we end same time same place same time thank same you. online place <laughs> thank you very much and same link and the same thank link you. same thank you. thank you professor dafte thank you again thank you man thank you everybody thank, thank you very much.